uh, getting a few technical um, details sorted out. Um, and I'm sure this isn't the first time you've heard that. So uh, appreciate your um, uh, understanding. Um, but hey, it's great to see everybody. My name is Jeffrey McCarthy. I'm the director of the Environmental Humanities Graduate Program here at the University of Utah. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce you to this uh, symposium. Um, Brooke Larson is going to uh, step up and outline um, our process today, uh, give us a land acknowledgement, and uh, introduce the panel. Uh, before that, I wanted to say uh, a few words of thanks and welcome. Um, it's nice to see students uh, here. It's nice to see alumni here. It's nice to see uh, community members uh, here and um, uh, other luminaries. So um, thanks again. Let me make a few comments on why this gathering is so important. Uh, the humanities give us critical tools for understanding the world, uh, the world we inhabit, and understanding the cultures we've sculpted to do that inhabiting. Oddly to me, this culture, the culture uh, of modern America, seems bent on self-destruction. And uh, looking at the Great Salt Lake, uh, uh, I, I can see what and, and where we are today. It makes me think about the consumerist, colonialist, capitalist culture uh, uh, that has had this impact uh, on the lake uh, and on our broader health. A recent New York Times report calls lake levels an, an environmental nuclear bomb in our midst. The Times story is one of many that underscores the dropping levels, the rising pollution, and the coming dust. This is important. But the discipline of environmental humanities insists that we contextualize such knowledge. And surely we can understand the lake, our lake, as one bitter pill among many among many poisons that a changing climate is pushing through the American West and across the globe. In other words, the local matters, but let's recognize the, uh, this local threat as one piece of an interlocking network of global crises that should be our common cause. Our lake is like Owens Lake. Our lake is like the Aral Sea. Our lake is like rainforests in Brazil. Our lake is like leaching of coral reefs. You can add your own examples, but probably take my point that the stressed ecosystems are linked. Given that backdrop, there's pragmatic hope in attending to this lake in this moment, in this community. Community, there's that word again. The environmental humanists here, the students, might ask, who exactly is this community? Who gets to speak? What kind of voice has authority? These are questions we ask, and these questions have informed the hard work of assembling this lively symposium. There's overdue good sense in learning from indigenous experience as we navigate climate volatility. A global crisis needs wisdom from all perspectives, not just a few. We need to hear from women. We need to hear from workers. We need to hear from people of color from the waters themselves, if we can. In conclusion, maybe listening to what comes can empower policy, maybe add new resilience, maybe add some resilience for this lake and this city. That is the humanities in action, and that's why it's great to see you all here. Thank you very much. Welcome, bro. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you not only for the introduction, but for jumping on board when I brought this idea to you, I think back in January. So this idea has been brewing for some time and just so grateful for Jeff and the Environmental Humanities Program for uh, supporting this effort, not only this symposium, but the larger effort to protect the Great Salt Lake. My name is Brooke. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Environmental Humanities Program. Uh, there's a lot of people that I'm about to thank, and then I'll move into a land acknowledgement and pass it on to the moderator of our first panel. So first, I want to thank 
Our generous partner um, who offered to host this event, the Natural History Museum of Utah, they have supported every part of this symposium from the event logistics to IT to marketing. These uh, beautiful graphics you've seen promoting this event, uh, that was all due to their support. Uh, we have two environmental humanities affiliates, an alum and a current student who also work with the museum, who I want to specifically shout out, Casey Clifford and Amelia Carter, who are standing back there by the door. Uh, <laughs> round of applause for Casey and Amelia. Uh, they've been helping support a lot with planning this event and printed out those amazing posters you have that are also thanks to Save Our Great Salt Lake and their Artists for Great Salt Lake campaign. So if you didn't grab one of those when you came in, please do. And Casey also designed those fun stickers. Uh, I hope you all take one of those as well. Uh, the museum is in the process of designing a new climate action exhibit. So we hope you stay tuned for that and check that out. It will just be in the space that's right outside the doors of where we are right now. And they also have been updating their Great Salt Lake exhibit. So I encourage you all to check that out as well. In addition to the museum, we want to thank our various partners across the University of Utah, including the Tanner Humanities Center, the College of Humanities, the American Indian Resource Center, and the Sustainability Office. Uh, we have Ali here, who's also at the table outside the door, who's with the Sustainability Office and uh, will be, has a little poster out there about the new climate plan that the university is making. So if you are affiliated with the university, we encourage you to go uh, learn more about that. And we also have loved collaborating with the Great Salt Lake Institute at Westminster College. We have Bonnie Baxter with us here today, who will be uh, hosting a conversation with one of our guests, Karen Piper, so you get to learn more about the work of the Great Salt Lake Institute then. I've also had some amazing students and colleagues supporting me. I want to highlight Fiona Summers, who's in the front row here. <laughs> Another round of applause for Fiona. Uh, Fiona has been my main collaborator on this project, helping with every step of the way from envisioning the program to creating this wonderful slides you'll see today. Uh, and Fiona is also working at Antelope Island State Park and will be a critical piece of the events that are happening tomorrow up there. Uh, and also just want to make another shout out to Corey, my colleague in the environmental humanities program who keeps the program running and will be uh, moderating the Zoom portion of the event today. And for those who are joining on Zoom, I apologize if the, we have tech issues throughout this event. We're doing our best. Uh, hopefully it'll work out okay for you. And finally, just want to thank all our speakers and moderators for being here. So that wouldn't be happening without all of you. And we're so happy to have you. The program is on our Environmental Humanities website. There are QR codes on the welcome desk that you can scan with your phone if you want to look at that throughout the day. And tomorrow we will be up at Antelope Island. We will kick off introductions at 10 15 and have our first event, which is a talk with Brad Perry and Rios Pacheco from the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. Uh, Rios Pacheco just recently illustrated a guide to Shoshone plants at Antelope Island, culturally significant plants. So they'll be talking about that and the importance of Antelope Island to the Shoshone Nation. And we have many other great events happening there tomorrow, which you can find on our website. So today we are gathering in so-called Salt Lake City, Utah, the unceded ancestral territory of the Goshute, Ute, Shoshone, and Paiute people. For our virtual attendees, we are utilizing the technology of Zoom, which is based in San Jose, California, on the unceded territory of the Olani people. We know that for land acknowledgements to carry real meaning, they must be followed up with action, and we hope Throughout this symposium, you learn from Indigenous leaders who will be sharing their wisdom and visions for repair. For our efforts to protect Great Salt Lake to be truly successful, our program knows we must listen to and follow the leadership of tribes who have called Great Salt Lake home for a time immemorial. 
That's why we're opening this symposium with a panel titled Great Salt Lake and the Great Grayson Tribes, Ancestral Connection and Pathways to Repair. This panel will be moderated by Samantha Eldridge, the director of the American Indian Resource Center here at the university. I'm so grateful that Samantha agreed to say yes, uh, agreed to moderate this panel, and for the critical work she does supporting Indigenous students on our campus. With that, I'm going to welcome Samantha, and you get to hear some of these amazing panelists. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brooke, for centering us around the land acknowledgement. And I really want to thank the organizers for providing space for this panel. Uh, we don't often hear from our tribal leaders, and we're not often brought into these conversations. And tribal consultation is often seen as an afterthought. So I'm glad that you know they're being really proactive. And there are a lot of lessons learned and with our history and the best practices that we seen in our community that our larger community in Salt Lake City um, can learn from. So I uh, just want to give a brief introduction of myself, uh, Samantha Eldridge, I'm the director of the American Indian Resource Center, and also want to quickly um, introduce myself in my traditional language. Um, I am Dene, um, Yata Shikat, Oshi Dene, Shat, Samantha Eldridge, and Isha, my English, Gishmi, Nishwe, Wahaglini, Bashi Chis, and Sakari, Dashi Che, Otto, who won the Funnish Dash Vanilla. And I just shared what my clan is, and that just really shows where I'm from and who I'm connected um, with um, in kinship. So I want to, uh, before we begin, I want to provide some um, brief bio introductions. Um, and I prepared some questions to help guide the conversation, and then we'll leave about 15 to 20 minutes at the end of the panel for some audience Q and A's. Um, so please be patient as I introduce everyone. Um, Karina Bode is a tribal chairperson of the Paiute Indian Tribe of Utah. She is an enrolled member of the Kanosh Band of Paiutes. She has represented the Kanosh Band as the chairwoman, secretary, and chair of the Housing Board of Commissioners. She also served 20 years for the Paiute Indian Tribe as an advocate outreach for the Four Points Community Health Clinics, Utah Paiute Housing Authority, and Resident Service. Chairperson Bo is also a traditional salt singer and believes that language, culture, and tradition are important and hopes that the unity of the South Paiute nations will help in preserving for future generations. Immediately to my left is Forrest Kutch. Forrest Kutch is an enrolled member of the Ute Indian tribe. He was raised on the Uinta and Ore Ute Indian Reservation in northeastern Utah and in the sacred Utah Shoshone Sundance religion. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree in the Behavioral Sciences from Westminster College. During his 38-year career, Forrest has held many challenging positions, including Education Director for the Ute Indian Tribe and Executive Director of the Utah Division of Indian Affairs. He served in that position for over 13 and a half years. During his time, Forrest wrote a book, A History of Utah's American Indian, and also played a key role in the PBS KUED sponsored curriculum project titled We Shall Remain, which features a video series of the histories of Utah tribes and accompanying materials. Uh, next to Forrest is Chair Chairman Rupert Steele. Rupert Steele is the current chairman of the Confederate Tribes of the Goshoot Reservation. Chairman Steele was born and raised on the Goshoot Reservation in Ibapa, Utah. He attended the Southwest Indian Polytechnic Institute and Northern Arizona University, majoring in forestry and a minor in natural resources. In 2015, Chairman Steele uh, retired from the federal government, in which he served over 35 years. Next to Chairperson Chairman Steele uh, is Darren Perry. Darren, Darren is a former chairman and current councilman of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. Darren serves on the board of directors for the American West Heritage Center in Wellsville, Utah, the Utah State Museum Board, the Utah Humanities Board, and the PBS Utah Board of Directors. He attended the University of Utah and Weber State University, 
and received his bachelor's degree in secondary education with an emphasis in history. Darren is the author of The Bear River Massacre, a Shoshone history, and teaches Native American history at Utah State University. So welcome panelists. So to begin, I want each of them to introduce themselves in their own way. Um, of course, we all know that the work that we do in our, in our community is beyond the titles that we have. So I'll begin with Chairperson Mo. My listener once, they're just little people. I'm Karina Bo. I'm the tribal chairwoman for the Paiute Indian tribe of Utah and the daughter of the late Ralph Joseph Pickabet, also known as Red Cloud, late Halvinia Bushhead Carrasco, also known as Halley of the Shipwits Band. The Paiute Indian tribe consists of five constituent bands located in four counties. We have um, Cedar and Indian Peak and Iron County. Of Kanash in Miller County, Kusharan in Sevier County, um, and um, Shibwitz in Washington County. We are the Paiute Indigenous Women People of this land, and the state of Utah is our Indigenous or ancestral land. Thank you. Did you want me to go more detail? No, that was great. Thank you. Thank you. I have to say something about the land acknowledgement first. When the University of Utah does that, they always mention the Paiutes, but I told her, I said, if there weren't any Paiutes up here, they were lost. <laughs> so, no Paiutes up here. <laughs> but anyway, I love her. So uh, my name is Darren Perry. I'm the former chairman of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. I live in Cache Valley today and a home center of where our people lived. And uh, it's an honor to be here. I've served on the council or as chairman for more than 16 years. I have one year left and I won't run again. Uh, I've, I've had enough and we'll let the youth take over from here, but I'll stay active. Uh, you're not gonna, I'm not disappearing, but I'm just gonna get off the council. So um, I stepped down two years ago when I ran for Congress. U.S. Congress, I stepped down as chairman, and I ran for Congress for one reason, to bring awareness to our environment and public lands and making sure that uh, they stay public and making sure we change the way we do uh, our stewardship over the environment. And so that was vitally important to me. I have no illusions that I would ever win. And I'm so grateful I'm not in Washington, D.C. every day. <laughs> but I'm honored to be here with friends. And, and I can truly call all of these people my friends. So thank you for having me. Morning. My name is Rupert Steele. I'm the chairman of the Confederate tribe of the Goshen. We have a sister tribe just to the east of us, the Skull Valley Band of Goshen. And um, we were split aside, side part of our history. We were split by the Great White Desert and the president putting some ink on a piece of paper. Same tribe, same belief, same values. And I want to say a little bit about the land acknowledgement. We know a land acknowledgement is not enough. As we gather here today, we are grateful that the Utah the indigenous nations are recognized and acknowledged about their stewardship of, of this land for millennia. The University of Utah sits on the Aboriginal lands of the Northwestern Band of Shoshones, the Confederate Tribes of Goshu, Scovelet Band of Goshu, the Paiute, the Ute, and the Navajo, the seven indigenous tribe of the of the uh, of the state. So uh, we collectively 
how proud are we? Following our ancestors, the management of our resources. I'm honored to be here today with you. Good morning. Uh, like my colleague said, Mike, our language, how you and you is very similar. Mike was, was hello, friend. So I'm sorry. That. I'm Forrest Kutch. I'm, um, I'm an elder now. I just want to say that um, one of the things I appreciate about the University of Utah, and as you can see, I'm a fan. <laughs> you know, the University of Utah, Utes, the name means something. I'll tell you why. If you take away that name, you erase it, every landmark, the only landmark that, that connotes uh, native presence in this Salt Lake Valley, mm -hmm. except for the Ute Cap Company, and that's not very. <laughs> okay, it's very important to us because it represents an effort in the past to basically erase our existence, our presence here, not only us but the other nations that lived in this area, and so. I love the university for that reason. And of all the institutions, um, I mean, I fought with the state too. But the University of Utah always managed to get along. Um, it's, it's departments from history to humanities to, um, to this museum participating in designing it. So to me, the uh, University of Utah is a, is a, is a beacon. Uh, for all of this and, and this struggle we're in right now. This is a life and death struggle right now. And we all need to stop fighting and joining together. So more on that later. Thank you all for those introductions. Um, so many of our tribal communities grew up with the Great Salt Lake pretty much in our backyards. And I really want to take some time and if each of you can just share, what does the Great Salt Lake mean to you as an indigenous person? Oh, do you want me to go first again? <laughs> Great Salt Lake Lake used to reach out to the down in Parowans. The Kanosh band was called the Pabans and once water people. The body of water was a resource. We were located where the Kanosh town is today. The Kanosh band logo is medicine man singing healing songs for the water. To the um, indigenous people, water is important. Water is life and we pray for the water we use. We pray for the animals, land. We pray for our people. land. We know if we take care of the gift the Creator gave us, 
It will take care of us. We are all connected to the elements of life, water, wind, earth, and fire, plants and animals. This is what the, what the um, Great Salt Lake means to the, to the Paiute people. Thank you. In one word, uh, the Great Salt Lake means to us, as, and especially me as an indigenous person, is life. I remember moving to Syracuse in 1965 as a young boy. Uh, Antelope Island was always the greatest place to slump Sunday school. <laughs> and go out to the island. And I remember years that we'd be mad because the lake was so high that it washed up the road. I remember those days, and I could never imagine a time when we'd be in the predicament that we are today, ever, growing up in Syracuse. And my parents are still, well, my dad's still there, but um, hearing stories from my grandmother, Maytee Mimbu, about the lake and the qualities from the lake, it was always just life to me. And so, um, as an indigenous young man growing up, uh, I learned to honor that perspective. And the lake meant something different to me. And to see where we're at today is, um, is really sad. So I'll talk more about some of the other things that the, that the lake meant to us later. But um, I guess if I could use one word, it would be life. Water gives life. Water takes life. The water, it is a native American and tribe, is a person. We sit in here. We are almost 90% water. Water is the most sacred, most powerful person in the world. Without water, we cannot survive. As my colleague said, we are here to speak for the, the ones that cannot speak, the wildlife, animals, the plants, soil, and trees, plants. And that's, when you look at it, you take water out of the circle of life. How are we going to replace that? Water is a non renewable resource. If we don't replace water, that's where the bad spirits will enter into our lives. My dad used to sink the water. Where everything he does is where it takes the dreams. Give thanks to the water. Talk to it as a person. And I still practice that today. I'm teaching my, my children and also my grandchildren and my great greats. When I see the connection water has at the Great Salt Lake. It saddens me today. I remember when I, I really used to be underwater. And those huge plants were, I mean, uh, pumps were placed out there. I think they're still, still sitting out there to pump that water out to the West Desert. Those were happy times. <laughs> but now when I see water, Receding fast makes me sad because that person is asking for help, trying to claw back as much as you, as much as you can, trying to get the water back in, into the Great Salt Lake. But there's no success. I see it drying up each and every time I come out here. Yes, we receive moisture. 
But as you hear the scientists talk about the weather data, it's a bleak report. So Great Salt Lake means a lot to my tribe. Our ancestors are lived around that area. All people are buried there by the water receded in the caves. So we have spiritual connection to the area. And it makes me proud to be out there. Although many people say, oh, they're not out there. There is life out there. You just have to stop and respect it. One of these days when you guys go out there, look around, what's there? There's grass, there's lizards, there's life. And water will take that life away from them. And water can take a life away from us. So in that way, I hope we take water into consideration. And it's sad to say that that message are written on the wall. We ignored it. Now we're suffering it. We're going to suffer long term from this. Everybody in the circle of life. We have to um, realize that um, <clears throat> um, our people have not inhabited this area for over 170 years. So it, there's been a separation from, from the lake. But what comes to mind is that back when my people lived mainly in Utah Valley, they, um, the Great Salt Lake was, was a sacred, powerful body, like Rupert said. And it was also a landmark because we didn't have uh, state boundaries back then. So you determined your location in relation to the lake if you were in this area. If you were further south or east, you would determine your location based on the mountains, mountain peaks and rivers. But out in this area, it was a major landmark, okay? And it was a, it was a powerful place. Um, my understanding is that the Salt Lake Valley was a buffer zone uh, between the Shoshone to the north and the Utes to the south. And although the Ute and Shoshone are related, or we all belong to the greater uh, Shoshone Nation, which includes um, many other tribes um, who occupied most of the Western states. The Shoshone Nation is huge. Includes all of us that are here. We're all related, but we <laughs> um, we often fought as cousins fight over territory, inner tribal disputes, marriage squabbles, and other reasons. Cousins fight each other. Um, and so this valley was a buffer zone, okay? Now, although the Utes probably occupied this area the most, it was still considered neutral. Uh, one of my relatives told me that the Utes did not like the smell of brine, uh, which could be strong at times according to the seasons and the directions of the wind. So that sometimes when they camped in this area, and they, they used to graze their horses, along the uh, eastern bench. And so when they camped, though, they, they liked to stay up in um, like City Creek Canyon um, off of the uh, desert floor. One of the um, councilmen, um, Ron Wapsock, claims that uh, his great grandfather was born up City Creek Canyon. Um, and the area is elevated and it's cool. And of course, access to water is, is the key. To, to when people would camp. Um, it was also a high lookout for enemies because as I said before, the tribe would fight. Um, we uh, I always talk about the, the attributes, the qualities of our people, which were very noble. And I think they have a lot of uh, credence um, to today's dilemma. But that didn't mean we weren't perfect. We weren't perfect by any means. We had our challenges. But the thing 
that is key, and I'll talk about this a little later, is what Rupert referred to, is the relationship to, to the elements, to water. It wasn't uh, an object. It was a it was a person. It was a spirit. It was a living thing, and we made that connection. That is that's that is the single most important thing to understand that our people bring to the table to today's crisis. Thank you. Um, so all of our panelists, you know, each shared that our connection to the Great Salt Lake has historical and traditional meaning and a common teaching is that water is life and so kind of expanding a little bit more and um the chairman still touched a little bit on this how has our relationship with the great salt lake changed over time and how does it look like now and maybe touch a little bit about the difficulty in seeing that change, knowing that we're moving in this direction to where it is now. And we'll start with Forrest. <laughs> I'm going to go back a little bit more in terms of the his historical significance and say um, my understanding is that the Utes claimed that area, which is the southeast shore of the Bay Salt Lake, most of the eastern side also um and um, according to jared farmer's book um, on zion's mouth the youths frequently hunted foul in that area uh, i recall reading or hearing that they would also charge a tribute or trade with other tribes coming into the area and salt was one of the um, items of tribute in fact one story i heard was that it uh, uh it was one of the ways we acquired the pipe um, Pipestone, which comes from the Great Lakes area, was through trade with tribes who were passing through. And um, they would come and they would acquire salt and they would take it back with them and trade with other tribes. Well, we would charge them tribute in, in the form of uh, um, the salt, would be something we would leverage as part of our tribute and also to pass through the area. Uh, we would uh, also trade items with them, um, pelts. Um, we were, our tribe is known for um, a fine um, a white tan buckskin. We really refined the tanning process. So that was a trade item. Um, we also traded for um, shells and um, any, any metal objects, uh, copper. Other other metals other tribes had uh, feathers, um, all kinds of trade items, obsidian, knives. Uh, trade was a big factor in this area. So uh, we were a pipe uh, smoking people. Uh, we, 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 it was part of our culture. We acquired the horse. Uh, it was another factor. We. Um, acquired the horse probably a hundred years later after our cousins in Colorado. And we're finding the reason is because we didn't depend on red meat as much as they did. We we 30% of our diet came from Utah Lake, Bonneville cutthroat, cutthroat and other species of fish, which were very abundant in that area. So um, but when we did acquire the horse the, that also enabled us to acquire a hunt a larger game. And uh, we could um, use the, the hides for, um, for teepees, for shelter. And so we, we became more of a plains, mountain plains tribe. Mountain plains is probably the best description for our people. So, um, so that's, uh, uh, again, we did hunt fowl in, that air, in the area. So it was a food source. But Brian was not, <laughs> but uh, the, the other factors were. So um, today, uh, see, we, we've been away for 170 plus years, so we don't have that relationship with the lake anymore. But like Rupert said, and, and, and the others said, it hurts our heart to see what's happening here. And I agree so much with the analogy you gave. That this 
is a is a reflection of what's happening in our part of the country, which is happening in other parts of the world. Okay, and we need to take it seriously. That that's like a the car, um, canary in the mine for us. It, it's a, it's signifying something. And later on, I'll talk about the sacrifices that that's going to have to go into this thing, because huge sacrifices are going to have to be made to to restore the lake, to re restore ourselves, because there's a underlying principle here is that the earth is sick. It's sick because we're sick. We're sick in the way we treat the earth. And so the earth has become sick. But, the earth, but, the, but nature is powerful, say, because it can still exist whether we're here or not. Okay? So it kind of has the advantage. It's up to us to wise up and make some changes. The lake has a great and significant similar value to us. It provides food for us. The waterfall was plenty back then. Animals used it. Grasses grew. So when the grass grew, it fed the animals. So when the animals but the point of at its most nutritional value of it during the time of the years, that's when we went out and killed the animal for for our dinner, we used all of it. So the lake provided that for us. And when I picture that in my mind, I see a lot of streams, fresh water stream feeding into that lake as it receded. That's where we were at. Some of you have made <coughs> read a book called Little White Indian Boy, where that boy came into here and he ran away from his family, went out to Great Salt Lake and played with the ghost shoot kids out there. So the ghost shoot kids took him home with him. He ran away and he stayed out there with him. So the soldier went after him, brought him back to his family, took him back from New York, somewhere back east. And the little boy wanted to come back. So the family brought him back over here. He ran away again. Went back out there, stayed with the Indians for a long time. It's, it's, it, it's a story that makes your heart feel good. That we got along together. We learned each other's way. We learned from each other. I always think about that. And it does have a real historical significance to us. It provides moisture for uh, some of you, maybe, or maybe uh, have taken uh, courses in a hydrological cycle. Great Salt Lake plays a significant role in how much moisture we get. It acts like a dipper, gets picked up by the clouds, goes up there, comes back, and replenishes us through rainfall. So once it's gone, we will miss that dearly. Thank you, Rupert. Um, I hope what you're hearing, the theme is that uh, we live in a state of relatedness. All things are related. They're not separate. And when my grandmother spoke about our animal and plant and water kinfolk, that meant something different to me. It meant that relationship was different. It meant that relationship was equal. 
not superior in any way. And so what the the majority of the lake is right in the heart of northwestern Shoshone land and extends up to some of our wintering areas in promontory. But what the lake meant to us was it fed our families, it healed our wounds, healed our spirits, cured our ills. My grandmother said there's medicine in the water that would cure people. And the plants and things that grew around it would, would also cure people. A year ago, I had a young woman call me and she said, you don't know me. My family owns a company here in Northern Utah called Compass Minerals. We take minerals from the lake. But I want you to hear something. And she put a tape recorder of my grandmother who'd been passed away for 15 years. And she said, she's talking about, we did an interview with her, talking about the significance of the healing powers of the Great Salt Lake. And to hear her voice again, talking about the sacred nature and our relationship with the lake, uh, meant something different to me. I spent the last 10 years of my life speaking about the history of my people, especially the Baron and Massacre, uh, that I want to spend the next 15 years of my life speaking about our relatedness to the environment and climate and our responsibilities going forward and how we can change it. But so uh, I want you to know it was a resource for us and it's, it's how we lived. We used every part of that lake to survive. Thank you. Um, our ancestors' resources were taken over by the settlers. We were forced to relocate in areas of the desert away from the major springs. Many of the bands died with died from starvation, guns, diseases. They no longer lived in permanent structures, homes. And this has changed. As I mentioned that um, the Kanach band were um, located where the Great Salt Lake had, you know, reached all the way down to Parowan. And then as it started, we started losing it. I think that's why the Kanach band, this is a medicine man that they, that is their local. And he is singing healing song for water. And I think a lot of that is because the water had dried up and they were trying to get back what was no longer there. So um, but as all of these gentlemen have mentioned, water is life. Water is sacred to all of us. We, the natives, we pray for everything. And water is one of our biggest prayers. Thank you. What role does settler colonialism play in the current crisis with the Great Salt Lake? Um, we all talked about our reciprocal relationship with the lake, the healing power, you know, the, the seeing the lake as a food source that brings our community together. Um, can you care, share a little bit about how those values and relationships have shifted since white settlers have displaced indigenous people's connection to the lake? And we will begin with Chairman Seal. When the settlers came in, our, uh, the oldest uh, tribal member that we have is going on 100 years old out on the reservation in Iowa. We sat down with the elders. We asked a question, similar question to this. Can you give us some information on the bars you could remember? The person said, yeah. So we uh, sat down with her and put her words onto a map. 
when we got out of, out of the elders was our tribe wintered close to the Kanai Span of Paiutes at the southern end of Snake Range. From there, they went up Spring Valley all the way to Wendover, all the way around north of the lake. Stop by and visit the North Lake Valley of Shoshones. They came down here, and by the time we got back down to to uh, Snake Valley, it was winter time. And from that, when the settlers came in, it cut off all connection, all trails to those places. We have water songs that we sing as we travel. The song goes, Give me direction, water. Lead me. Give me good thoughts. Take away my bad thinking this morning. That's how that song goes. From water source to another source. Or another water source. And from there, next day, you sing it again. As you travel. That was cut off. It affected my people. Could not do it anymore. Could not, cannot do it today. So that did have an a adverse effect on us. And the other one was a version of streams, those freshwater streams that beat the Great Salt Lake for irrigation. That limited the animals that were using that stream what we used to harvest our animals and pick berries, sing our song, breathe among those places. So I did have a, a background. So those values we still have with us, but we just cannot go out and practice because We've gone through all the different phases and tried to change us. So the last thing the federal government came up with was on the reservation. In 1863, the Confederate tribes negotiated here in Duella, Duty Valley, we call it. Duty means black bear in Shoshone. Black bear valley. When the settlers got here, they changed it to Ella. Now to the current to Ella. And uh, so it, it, it did change our way of identifying these places. A lot of these places have Indian names. For example, Onaki Mountain. That means salt mountain to us. In our language, it means salt mountain. A lot of these places were changed. So uh, when settlers got here, yeah, there was a huge change in our lives. The land that colonizers, <laughs> Brigham Young, the first saints that arrived here, wasn't untouched or wild. As some have described, but I think it was it was a we managed it in a way that we practiced long range uh, environmentally friendly ways to manage the resources that we had. You see, the environment and the land and the water was our grocery store. We had to take care of it. We had to treat it in a way that was different. Um, one thing that kind of makes me nuts is we talk about owning the land. I don't think any of us ever felt like we owned the land, but we had a divine stewardship in charge of a certain piece of land. And that's a distinction that's not understood. 
today in the world uh, are stewardship over that environment, not ownership. And that's the difference. Colonial America changed. The resources became for sale. The resources were available now for extraction, depletion, ownership, until we've used every last drop of goodness that was there, and then we move on. And that's where we're at today. Western worldviews promote individual rights and do everything we can to get ahead for ourselves and our families. Indigenous values promote our obligations, obligations to the past, obligations to the present, obligations to the future, and obligations to each other. Imagine the Iroquois Nation, their leadership doesn't make any decisions without considering what effects that decision would have on seven generations ahead. Imagine the implications for the future if our leaders decided to govern in that way. But that's exactly the way we need to start looking at how we govern going forward. It's not about what the dollar we can make today. It's about how we can manage this for our grandchildren's future and our future great-grandchildren's futures. Looking back, um, during this time, the tribe was wrongfully terminated. We, um, in 1954, termination was hard on our people. It was a huge change they weren't prepared for. And they didn't understand what was happening. Several of our tribal members didn't speak English, so their cries went unheard. And all they wanted was a simple life back. With termination, they, were, they now faced criticism and ridicule for being the proud people they once were. The strength they carried in their long care and the strong belief they held in their hearts were being broken as they were forced to cut their hair or bidden to speak their language, stop their tradition, and be a part of a group they didn't understand. During this time, the bands lost thousands of acres of land to taxes and many deaths were due to illness and starvation. The Paiute indigenous people of this land once numbered thousands. And as of February 24, 2022, the total number of tribal members among the five constituent bands is 917. Our leaders fought and our people fought hard to get back what was lost. We finally received federal recognition on April 3rd, 1980. And we honor, respect, and thank our leaders and those individuals who fought diligently to get us where we are. We have a um, powwow that we, that uh, federal recognition powwow, April in the second week of June. And we invite everybody to come out, come out and see the beauty of our tradition, our culture. There's two different um, dances that you're able to join in on, and that is the um, inner tribal and the round dance. So don't forget to come down and join us in our powwow and our celebration in June. Thank you. How many of you have heard of the um, term doctrine of discovery? Doctrine of discovery is few of it. Doctrine of discovery was a, a powerful bull or a declaration by the Pope in 1493 during the discovery period. They realized that, that new lands were being dis uh, discovered and um, and most of them were occupied by indigenous people. So it presented a problem. Well, what do we do with these people, or these indigenous creatures, really? Because they didn't really view us as people, because the declaration basically said 
since these people do not believe in, in Jesus, uh, they're not Christian, uh, they're not people. They're heathen savages, and therefore they have no rights to the land. Okay. So that, that policy um, uh, began as soon as Columbus, is, uh, Cologne and his people arrived in Hispaniola, that, that policy was instituted to this day. In fact, in many ways, it still exists because um, the settlers pretty much carried that sentiment with them as well. It's, it's, their leader, Brigham Young, um, it was on his shoulders to, to, to try to figure out how to do that. But as far as, and he had some ideas. He, he thought maybe the, the people could live together initially. Um, and then it changed. Uh, he joined uh, with the rest of the settlers and saying, well, that's not going to work. We've got to just move out of the area. Okay. Settlers, they were not very conscious of, of the significance that the Indian people were human. Uh, that, that didn't move. It wasn't a moving emotion. Um, I mean, basically, um, indigenous people were just simply ignored or moved out of the area. Okay. And so there was a, a, an attempt, even to this day, to ignore the historical presence. Okay, as I mentioned, the landmarks. Well, go down Utah Valley, there's no landmark, not one. And yet that was the homelands of my people, the few Indians. So there's there's a little bit of unfinished business there. <laughs> a little disrespectful. And uh, consequently, there, there's really no relationship to today. And it, what relationship does exist is very superficial. The uh, the legis state legislature mainly consults only when they have to, or when federal law mandates such. Mm -hmm. uh, there's never been a gesture to the contrary to reach out. Um, I'm hearing horror stories about Utah Lake and some of the proposals to develop um, islands and housing in the middle of the lake. Well, I'm going to fight that one. With everything I have, and um, I, I was involved in one discussion, and I hope to be involved more in that discussion. I mean, that is just horrendous. Has no place here. So, so we really have not developed our voice. We're trying. The sad thing is, a lot of our traditional leaders. Like Darren's grandma, May, uh, the powerful uh, traditional leaders and, and, and Rupert's people here. A lot of them are passing on, but we're losing a lot of this wisdom that needs to be brought to this discussion today about what we can do. Okay. See, what it really comes down to is the clash of the worldviews that occurred when Columbus arrived here continues today. Uh, one society uh, believes in control of nature. The other one believes in cooperation with nature, treating nature as a part, uh, an integral part of our, our humanity. It's, it's our home, but it's also us. So it's, it's, there's a big difference in philosophy and, and belief system now, and it's dividing our world. And it's not just uh, our people here, people to the North and the people to the South, South Americans, Central America are dying in defense of the, the Earth. Our people up North, uh, the North Dakota water uh, uh, protests suffered from that protest. And South America, Brazil, Bolivia, people are dying okay. protect the, the rainforests. So this is uh, this is what it really comes down to. It's a, it's really a challenge of um, um, belief and mindset, and it goes back to uh, 
comparing the two value systems. I did a paper back in uh, 1986, and I compared the value systems of the settlers. And back then, it was um, the settlers were capitalists and pursued capital gain. The native people were socialists. We've always been socialists, and, and we've been sharing. In the book, Carlos Barrios, uh, um, Destiny, Sacred Destiny, I forget the name of it. Carlos Barrios is a Mayan anthropologist. His uh, study revealed that most of the native people from throughout the Western Hemisphere, number one value is generosity, sharing. So we're socialists par excellence. That's all there is to it. We make lousy business people because <laughs> we don't really follow um, a hierarchy. We're too egalitarian. Okay? And we've had experience with leadership, and most of it indicates that they get corrupt. The ego takes over, they get corrupt and greedy. And the United States still hasn't figured that one out because we allow our leaders, congressmen, to have extended terms of office forever. You know, wise up to that. Dominant culture was always uh, consumption oriented, hoarding. Uh, our people, we used what we needed and only what we needed. Even today, I have that in my system. I don't like to waste, especially food. We mentioned the uh, hierarchy versus egalitarianism. Most of the tribes, contrary to popular belief, had situational leaders. We need to go hunt, we got to hunt sheep. Rupert's the best hunter. He's going to lead. But after the hunt, sit down, Rupert. You're no longer a leader. We have to go to war. Samantha's going to be our leader. After the war, sit down, Samantha. <laughs> now, when we did have leaders, standing leaders, it was because they had certain qualities. The elders used to watch them when they were little. So, oh, this person has a, is a kind, loving heart. So this is the kind of person we want to lead our people. So usually they weren't the big time macho, macho types. They were they were connected mind and heart. They're powerful that way. If you look at some of the traditional leaders like that, City Bull first and foremost was was a, a healing person, a healer. He was a medicine person first and foremost before he became a war or chief. Yeah, to defend his people. A lot of our leaders were that way. Um, accumulation of wealth versus generosity, competitive society versus cooperative. Today, the same way. Analytical linear versus holistic thinking. We still have trouble. And our, and our school system is designed for analytical linear thinking. Now, our kids always struggle with that because we're holistic thinkers. What you got to do is teach us music, dance, and song. First, and art, get us interested in the world, and then slowly introduce math and science, and we'll pick it up. Because it's done, not a matter of intelligence, it's a matter of culture. But the American school system kept jamming us round people into a square peg, and it never really worked. We start pounding on it, and that's when we had the trauma from the boarding school system. And our people are still struggling with that today. Alcohol, drugs, it's all trauma related. Scientific versus spiritual. You know, you get right down to it. Our people really didn't see them as separate. Yeah, there's physical laws, but there, there's an interplay between them. They're all part of the same. Our people knew that. Patriarchal, there's a big one. We were a lot of, not all tribes, but most of our people were matriarchal. The women uh, possessed the property rights in most tribes. So if guys want to go pull around, they'd, have, they'd come home and all their stuff would be outside the garage. <laughs> and there's nothing we could do about it. <laughs> so, some of our people had some good ideas, but we were the savages. We were branded savages, right? We didn't have anything to offer. To this day, we still think that way, right? 
Dominion over nature versus one with nature. Really what it comes down to. I remember as a teenager, I was mouthing off to my aunt. I said, you know, I don't believe in God anymore. My aunt Margie looked at me and she said, what? And I was kind of just bluffing. I said, come over here. I said, look at this leaf. Can you make that leaf? Look at that squirrel over there, those birds. Can you do that? What can you do? And that's when it really nails me. <laughs> but you know, that lesson stayed with me to this day. I'm sharing that with you because there's a lot of wisdom in it. It's powerful. What can we make? We didn't make this world. We have no business destroying it. Really what it comes down to. Thank you. So when I was first approached to moderate this panel, I thought an hour and 45 minutes, oh my goodness, that's a lot. And then now we're closing in on the time that we have and I'm like, that's not enough time. We're just now getting into it. <laughs> um, but I really wanna leave time for audience Q and A. So kind of bringing us back to the discussion topic, pathways to healing. And we, our panelists kind of touched upon it, you know, connecting us back to the meaning um, and purpose be behind our water songs and um, thinking about the decisions that we make and how they impact seven seven generations going forward. So um, it's going to be a little bit difficult, but if we can quickly go through our panelists and if you can share how our Indigenous worldview, wisdom, and values can help inform us moving forward. If you, if you don't remember anything about today, remember me saying this, and I hope I say it five times today. All the science in the world is not going to make up for our selfish behaviors. The idea that science is superior in any way to indigenous wisdom um, that can be a barrier to lasting collaboration. And collaboration is what we need for today, at this time, this space. But when we combine the science with the indigenous wisdom, we weave that together, as Robin Wall Kimmer beautifully says. We braid that together. The strengths that those two things bring is going to be how we solve this today. So um, I'll leave it at that. Make sure I say that again though later today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for me, I think um, what I think is if you do not stop the development, we're going to run out of water. Our animals, habitats are being destroyed right now and they're starving and forced to relocate. And so I think that we need to do some kind of um, hold on the development in Utah. I believe that we need to save our water for who's here now. That's what um, my thoughts are on that. Thank you. <coughs> the people that were here for Diamond Mill in, in Memorial. When you look at the history, drought had a lot to do with the people that used to live here moving on. They went other places. Mother Earth does not mess around with us. She controls us. You guys heard that we don't own anything. Mother Earth owns it. We just borrow it from her. And if we don't change, it must start within each and every one of us. Our hearts, our bloods are all red. And if we don't change, we can change our attitude. I can say, I promise you, 
I will not engage in this this weekend. And then next week, my behavior goes back to the same way. We have to change that. We have to bring water as a person. That has to change. We cannot take it for granted anymore. So please, please, when you think before you take a drink, thank water for everything that it done for us. Save it for our children. Save it for our grandchildren, great great grandchildren. That's the only way we will survive. All four races: the white, the black, the red, and the yellow race. There are four races in the world. We are all in this circle together. We must collaborate. We need each other. And it's going to be a huge challenge, but we must face it head on. Uh, how many of you have gone without water for a day? Raise your hand. How many for two days?